In this video, I want to talk about the induction motor. Specifically, I want to talk about its components and its parts and how we can put all of those parts together in order to get a working induction motor. There are a lot of videos that deal with how an induction motor works and it is good if you know the theory, but you also need to know the components that are involved and why it's designed the way it is. And that's the idea of this video. It's to increase your understanding of why the induction motor looks the way it does, why it has the components it has, and what you're likely to encounter when you're working with this type of machine. So let's get started. This is our induction motor. If you've ever worked in an industrial plant, you will most likely have seen this type of motor. It is incredibly popular. This induction motor we're looking at now is what they call a squirrel cage induction motor. I'll explain to you what that is in a moment, but for now it's important just to realize that there is another type of induction motor, it's just not as popular as this one. So the squirrel cage induction motor will look a lot like this. They can be quite small, they can sometimes be quite large also. They're quite rugged, they're quite cheap, they have few parts, and the few parts they have are easy to maintain. If you put all of these aspects together, it is an engineer's dream. A machine that runs and runs and doesn't cause you too many headaches while it does it. I should say while we're going through this video that everything I'm doing in this video, you can also do at savory.com. So check out some of the links in the video description if you'd like to do that. And if you're enjoying this video, don't forget we've got over 40 hours of engineering video courses that you can also access at savory.com. Let's start by breaking the induction motor down into its components and we can talk about why we have these components in the first place. So the first thing that we should look at, I think, is the fan. I'm going to take the fan cover off for a moment. I've removed the fan cover and you can see we've got a black fan on the end of the motor. The black fan is connected to the rotor shaft. That's this circular piece that we're looking at here. And it's connected via a key. And that's that rectangular piece here that's sticking out. That would be our shaft key. By connecting the rotor shaft to the fan in that manner, we can transfer the rotary motion from our rotor to the fan. If I press play, can see that the rotor is spinning. Can have a look at the key. And as the rotor spins, the key spins, and we transfer that rotary motion to our fan. But why do we have the fan in the first place? Well, it's because all electrical machines generate some form of heat when current is passing through them. As current passes through a conductor, and it might be a copper conductor, an aluminium conductor, etc., it's going to generate heat the conductor itself forms a resistor, even if it's a very, very small one. With a motor, we need to get rid of that heat. And the way we get rid of that heat is by transferring it first to the casing, what we call the frame. That's this item where my mouse is now. And then to these sticky out fins that are sticking out the side here. You can see them. They look quite rectangular in shape. They're long, thin plates and they're welded to the frame usually and these allow the heat to be passed to the air quite quickly. The plates increase the contact surface area between the air and the motor frame or the motor casing. In order to get even more cooling we use a fan. The fan rotates like this and if we put back on our fan cover for a moment the air actually passes out through channels. You can see here, there's a little gap and the air is blown across the motor. And as it's blown across the motor, the air becomes hotter and it takes away some of the heat from our motor casing or motor frame. And that is essentially why we have the fan. It's because we want to provide additional cooling. If you can provide additional cooling, then the motor can work that little bit harder without overheating. A lot of electrical machines are actually limited in design because they can't get rid of the heat quick enough. Let's actually take a look at the frame for a moment. Now you can really see those cooling fins on the side and that's what we're going to use to transfer the heat 
when the motor's in service to the surrounding air. Notice we've also got these holes here. These holes are where we pass the bolts through. The bolt will pass through here and then through the next one. And then we clamp the bolts together and they close the inside of the motor frame. They actually close both ends and the two ends that we use are called end bells. So there's our end bells. See they've been put on now and the end bells just seal the inside. They're not going to seal it to such a degree that no air or dust is going to pass through it, but they are going to form quite a good seal. So those are our end bells. Let's just add our bolts for a moment. See we've got the bolt here. It's going to pass all the way along here. And then we've got a nut which we can tighten up. And then we're going to push those two end bells onto our motor frame and that's all going to clamp together. On the top of the frame we've got a lifting eye. The lifting eye allows us to move the motor around without breaking our back, literally. If you've ever worked with these motors before and you've worked with one that's quite large or even let's say 30, 40, 50 kilos, you'll know that when you're trying to move them around and manhandle them, they can be quite awkward. And I really do suggest that if you are lifting these motors up, you definitely keep a straight back because if you lift them incorrectly, you're most likely going to injure yourself. For this reason, you have a lifting eye here. And nowadays, if you're working in a professional manner, you should be connecting a chain block or a hoist or something like that and using a machine or some mechanism to lift the motor up. In this way, you can prevent injuring yourself or anyone else who might be manhandling such a large motor we now know exactly what each of these components are doing and why. We've pretty much covered all of the components that make up an induction motor. Thank you very much for your time.